Hello, everyone. Our first company presenting today is going to be Brainstorm. For Brainstorm, I have Chaim Leibovitz. Uh, he is the president of the company, the operational CEO right now, and he's been there since the start of the company in 2006. Uh, it's a very interesting company because we're talking about Lou Gehrig's disease. What I really believe you have to consider when we're talking about ALS is, first rule, do no harm. So when we come up with a screen or a way to sort out who's doing what in ALS, I want to ask you the first question, which is, what is the risk around the therapy? And what I really like about this company is it's a very safe therapy. I don't believe there's any significant risk. And then you get to the next question, which is, is there efficacy? Or do we believe there's a trend? And so to talk a little bit about Brainstorm and where they are and where they are clinically is Haim Leibovitz. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Um, so, uh, brainstorm. Brainstorm, uh, Jason already summed it up in his way, but we prepare some slides and we go according to that for a moment. Uh, our platform technology, Neuron, is a proprietary mesenchymal stem cell based drug delivery system for neurotrophic factors. We have broad series of patents on the cells, methods of producing, and the methods of the use. Uh, we have a fast-track ALS program in phase, phase two. To date, we have data for over 60 ALS patients treated in clinical development programs in the U.S. and in Israel. And we've seen excellent single-dose intraticular and intermuscular safety profile. And the efficacy signals are preserved in the ALS FRS score and the FEC. We completed enrollment in the phase two study at Mass General Hospital, uh, University of Massachusetts and Mayo Clinic. And a multiple dose study will be launched in 2016, which I'll talk in a moment about. We're targeting additional clinical indications in 2016, autism and the progressive multiple sclerosis. And we will finance through, through the year. The key attrib attributes for Neuron. It's the only stem cell technology to, di to di differentiate mesenchymal cells into specialized we call like nanopons, factories, of secreting these neurotrophic factors. The cells also possess antigenic and immunomodularity uh, characteristics and desired functions achieved ex vivo prior to administration without any genetic modification. Potency and identity assays using during manufacturing, preclinical proof of concept in multiple disease models, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, etc. Many neurodegenerative diseases as well as also stroke and spinal cord. Uh, Easy and safe delivery via intertical and intermuscular injections and a strong intellectual property. We also have uh, uh, orphan status for ALS in the US and the EU. The manufacturing process, which is very important, I think, in the stem cell industry. Uh, there are many, many stem cell companies out there, and I believe that those companies that figure out the manufacturing issue and the cost of goods, et cetera, is, are going to be the ones that are going to be leading this industry. So. While, while, and specifically when you speak about autologous treatment, the question is, are you able, going to be able to manufacture once approved? And as a company getting closer to being approved, either the regular way or either with a conditional pathway, which we'll discuss soon, I believe, we got to be able to deliver the goods. So patient will come in and we will harvest them, derive the bone marrow-derived cells, isolate them, we purify it to 0 0.02 or something like that, which are mesenchymal cells. We know the know-how to expand the hundreds of millions of cells. We even expanded to patients up to 500 million cells. And then we have a differentiation process, and then we, uh, uh, we re-inject it into the same patient. Uh, we started off uh, years ago, and uh, it was a big worry for Jason, I remember, as an analyst. It took us ov over 46 days to do this process. Today, we're down to 15 days. We used to process in every clean room two patients a month. Today, we are processing over four, and we are now designing our own clean room where we're going to be able to do 20 products in one clean room per month. Meaning, once approved, let's say we have five clean rooms, you're going to be able to do 100 products per month, et cetera. Um, this is recently published in January uh, in JAMA Neurology, a paper that shows the results of the Israeli trials. Uh, these are the results of the combined intertechal patients. Uh, we had uh, 26 patients that got intertechal injections at various stages of the ALS FRS score. And uh, you can see uh, the ALS FRS score in these patients, it's really a statistical significant result, but it's a very, of course, it's a very small uh, patient population to, to, 
to get to final, uh, of course, conclusions. The FVC, you see something very similar. So these were the four uh, um, slides that we preserved, and so we'll have some more time uh, that uh, my Jason should interview. Yes. Well, we can have some questions. So I, I want to talk a little bit about ALS, and let's talk a little bit about data. But before we get there, since there were some manufacturing uh, panels and a manufacturing was a very big theme, and you mentioned that you know, you've, you've dropped manufacturing down to 15 days and that with clean room adjustments you could do how many samples in one clean room in 15 days? Exactly. We can, we can do products. We are doing today already four to five every month. And uh, with our new design clean room, which we didn't yet approve on the board to build it, but we have appro uh, approved a new designed clean room, we will be able to do 20 products per month in one clean room. Okay, so, so that's exciting. And, and also talk with me a little bit about cryopreservation. Uh, exactly. Because uh, uh, one of the things that's, you know, if this therapy works, it's likely that there might be multiple dosing. So help me understand whether that might be viable. Exactly, you, you're going to the right direction. Definitely, we see one thing. First of all, safety, as you mentioned, the profile is just excellent. Now, when it comes to the efficacy, which I want to say a moment, talk a moment about, the, the issue is we, we're facing are the variabilities for ALS is just almost one of the worst neurodegenerative diseases, not only when you talk about fatally with the variabilities. And the other issue is what we see that our treatments also have a variable effect on patients. It means patient to patient don't have the same effect to the cells. We even see the secretion of the cells from patient to patient, the neurotrophic factor secretions, while we see a huge, dramatic, higher secretion with our cells versus the regular mesenchymal cells, we do see variability, terrible variability from patient to patient. And uh, we're trying to see if they correlate with the results we see. And we have lately seen, and of course not yet published, we'll publish it soon as, uh, from the, the US trials, the CSF from patients before treatment and after treatment, and we see the secretion very high of the various neurotrophic factors. And we still want to figure out which neurotrophic factors are the most important that really are the ones that have the impact. So that's one, one of the issues. Now the other issue, of course, we said from day one, we'll have a multiple dose treatment. It won't be a one-time treatment, definitely. And we have seen compassionate patients only three multiple dose, so that at least established a safety profile for us. And we have seen, by the way, in those three patients, wonderful results after the three. One of them patients, we, we published a paper. But we had to learn how to cryopreserve the cells in order to do a clinical trial, which we did. We validated them, that the cells, uh, after being cryopreserved, behave the same or almost the same uh, as the fresh cells. And the multiple dose trial, which we already published, uh, w which we uh, published the news that we are uh, launching is a 24 open label trial in Israel just to start to learn the dosing. But the truth is after we are looking at all of the data we have, we're understanding the issues of power, having a power trial going forward, uh, we have now uh, the, probably the best statisticians in the field uh, that understand ALS and have experience with ALS. We're trying to design and maybe we will elevate this multiple dose trial into a power trial. And we're looking maybe north of 100 patients to try to power such a trial based on the complications I just said and the variabilities of both the disease, the terrible variabilities, by the way, which I didn't mention, the ALS FRS score is, a, is a, the only known score there in addition to the SVC, but it's 13 different components. So we're working on all of that. We are encouraged what we see until now. But. So, so let me sort out some of the things that you just said, because you just said a lot of things. Uh, one, cryopreservation looks like it's viable. It looks Definitely like this will be a multi-dose strategy. And so I could look at the cost of making product across 15 days, maybe divided by 10 doses or something like that. So that cost actually becomes biotech-like in terms of its margins, if I consider it. A, a, right on the point, exactly. OK, good. Now let's talk a little bit about data, because you started to talk about data, and I really want to focus in two areas. One, what data do you have now that demonstrates that there's a signal? And then two, when you're, you're talking about the Israeli trial, which, which is going to be exploring multiple dosing and the potential for that trial to expand into what might be a registrational trial. But before we talk too much about Israel, help me understand, we understand ALS is a variable disease. 
very, very tough endpoints, certainly, certainly a graveyard for failures. What signals have you seen that give you so much enthusiasm to believe this is going to work? Yeah, you're asking a very good question. So first of all, the multiple dose trial, if it's going to be elevated, won't be only in Israel. That's number one. Number two, I'm very happy to talk about Israel. Number three is that um, the signals we have seen, the doctors, all the doctors involved, and we have the best KOLs and, uh, as our principal investigators, both in Israel and in the United States. Yes, I didn't mention it. Uh, uh, Professor Bob Brown is the president of, uh, uh, of the Academy of Neurology, and uh, Merit is the chair of neurology in Mass General. Tony Windebank is a former dean of Mayo Clinic, and all of them are, by the way, expert, their expertise is as clinicians, as scientists, and as stem cells, which is very rare to find that combination, which right fitting our companies in these very prestigious centers. And all of them tell me that they see patients that it just cannot be a placebo effect. In, in the first place, the placebo effect in patients for ALS is quite minimum. The issue with, you do need, you do need the placebo arms for various reasons. The main reason is because the variabilities of the ALS patients, one of the variability issues are that some patients, some months, stay stable for no reason. We, we cannot know up front when those months happen, why it happens. Some patients, there's even a 10% that stay stable then 20 years. Like Steve Hawking is known that, yes, his deterioration was terrible, then now, but he's alive and he's, he's operating for so many years. So therefore, there's no placebo effect perhaps, but there is gonna be an effect of being stable. So the truth is placebo sometimes endangers your results. And that's why we have uh, unpowered groups. It's not so simple. So therefore, we are now trying to do a powered trial, at least design one, so we'll elevate starting in Israel with probably 50 or so, whatever the clinicians will come up with the final design, and the other arm would be in the States as well. So what I hear you saying is that, in, because I am familiar with the data, that, that in the data what you saw is a slowing of deterioration. The slope of deterioration seemed like it was really changing, and I, and I think you're making the point that how do you demonstrate that that is absolutely drug-induced and not placebo-induced, and I, I guess that's the challenge, and that's why you're talking about these great statisticians and the proper powering and the proper design of the phase two trial, and how, what, what might that trial look like? Exactly, so first of all, when you said the, the data looks good, then I agree, of course, it looks good, but it's the mean number, and the mean number shows a slowdown. Now, when you say a slowdown, the mean number, it could be some patients did not respond, but some patients did respond strongly. Those patients that we see these strong responses, the doctors are convinced that it has to be an effect of the cells. But on the other hand, yes, we're having the issues of being able to prove it based on the current regulatory uh, process, which, which is understandable, but it's not gonna be easy as the variabilities of the patients. And that's why, why we have to find out the dosing of the trial anyways. We don't wanna lose more time. We're trying to power, power this trial as well. And the, the end point for the trial is going to be a composite of ALS scores that are essentially going to map function from the start of the trial, and then how far after you, the patients receive doses will you measure the end point? It's a very important issue. Now, there are psychokinetics, as you know, failed in the phase two ALS trial, not a, not a stem cell treatment, and they went on with a phase three trial where they changed the primary endpoint. Their primary endpoint was ALS FRS score. And in the phase three trial, which the agency FDA approved, uh, the primary endpoint is SVC only. And there's a reason, because of the terrible variability of the ALS FRS score. They too feel that their treatment had a good result. They were able to, to persuade the agency with that and said, but we can only prove it, prove it with SVC. Now the difference of FVC, FVC shows more uh, the length of life rather than the quality of life, if you can want to say it in that way. So FVC, functional vital capacity, uh, yes. or the patient's ability to breathe. Exactly. So most of the patients, that's when they die, when the lung uh, cells, the lung muscles just don't work anymore. And if you can show a strong effect there, that's very, very important. But on the other hand, you also want to see the life quality. And the problem is, as we said, the components, there's so many components. And uh, I spoke to one of the authors of the ALS FRS score, Professor Jesse Sidebaum, and they say that they're trying to find the solution and to find a different score so I, we're not going to invent a different score. I think it's, we're not talking about having this multiple dose trial while we're trying to find the right, right dosing. Uh, we won't exactly figure out a, a, new, a new score. So what we're going to do, we want to have a power trial to, have, to find the signals both in the LSFRS score and SVC and probably also other neurological measurements, which are objective, objective measurements 
a subset from the score as well. What's the next catalyst? What's the next data point? I see your last bullet says finance through the phase two readout. When is that phase two readout and what data are we going to see? Well, what data are we going to see? I don't know. It. We, are blind, we are blinded. Uh, but in June, uh, we will see the phase 2A data. And uh, that will really let us design our next phase. How many patients in the phase 2A trial? 48 patients, 3 to 1 randomization. Probably not the best randomization. But again, it, it wasn't really a power trial. It was two years ago. We didn't even have the Israeli data. So we went with what was the best uh, assumptions then. And, and the phase 2A trial was run in the United States? Phase 2A trial was run in the United States in the three centers I mentioned before, in Mass General, and UMass, and the Mayo Clinic. And, uh, you know, some data of some patients, patients are talking out there, so people know, but we don't know yet which patients got treatment or not, okay. so we're waiting. But that Phase 2A trial is kind of our next chance to see whether there's a signal and how robust the signal is. Definitely, and more, more so we want to learn from that which patients respond better and which not, if we can find out based on the neurotrophic factor secretions, which we are trying to look now, which patients respond better. So that will be help us in the next design. It's terrific. I want to thank Chaim Leibovitz for giving us an introduction to Brainstorm. Thank you very much.